welcome to this special episode of the Teaser Pop podcast. Now, if you're familiar with this podcast, we like to do something different in our special episodes. So today I'm joined with Chris, who'll be sharing three favorite works of literature that have inspired him as a teacher. Chris has over 30 years of experience in education, starting as a librarian before becoming a teacher of English. His longest stint of service was 20 years serving in a school that had over 60 home languages. It's an absolute delight to have you on the show, Chris. Thank you for your time. And it's wonderful to be here, Laura. In today's episode, Chris will share three works of literature, briefly what they're about, what stands out about them for him, and some of the favourite quotes from those pieces. Now, of course, this is all down to our own personal preferences, so I encourage you to share your favourite works of literature in the comments on the website or on our social media, because we'd love to hear your suggestions too. Which work of literature would you like to start with first? Let's start with Joan Didion's Slouching Towards Beth. This was a collection of um, 1960s journalism. And in it, she's writing about the counterculture, as it was then phrased. But don't get carried away with the idea that it's one of those, oh, how wonderful the hippie movement is, things. She is very, very aware of the dangers and the problems in the movement at that time. But it's not just about that. It's about her personally, how she reaches out and talks to you as a journalist, as a person. And what is it particularly about this piece of work that stood out for you? When did you read it? Maybe that's the first thing I should ask you. When did you first encounter this piece of literature? This was one of the books I encountered as a set text hmm. um, to teach for any level. Um, exciting times. Um to have pieces of journalism. And I'd never heard of Joan Didion before that. But what struck me and what has stayed with me is her style, the way that she writes. And I think the style of all the, all of the pieces that I've actually chosen is one of the keys. I mean, it's Nabokov who said, uh, you can trust in a murderer to give you a good prose style. So, uh, that's perfectly true. Joan Didion invites us into her life, invites us into California, sometimes invites us into America and other parts. It's a very wide-ranging selection of essays. Uh, it's interesting that this was something that was assigned to you and that's how you discovered it. Sometimes there could be quite a tense relationship between works that you're given to teach <laughs> I think I'm speaking for myself and that your own preferences so this is really lovely that this was something that really inspired you uh, even though it was set by the curriculum mm -hmm. well teaching for that long I suppose one was going to say one was going to find the bits of gold yeah. amidst all the rest that went past and obviously it did leave me with a problem when you asked me to do this of deciding which to choose. <laughs> I mean, it's, it is so difficult from that it treasure trove that's out there. It really is. And considering how much you read as well, um, mm. it's quite difficult to whittle it down to three. So maybe this won't be the first episode that we record <laughs> in this place. <laughs> um, so for Slouching Towards Bethlehem, do you have a particular favourite verse that you'd like to share? Well, it's, as I said, it's, it's like plucking a feather from a beautiful bird. In the first essay, She's writing about not the counterculture. She's writing about an America that most of us will probably never, ever have encountered. And there she writes, this is the California where it is possible to live and die without ever eating an artichoke, without ever meeting a Catholic or a Jew. This is the California where it is easy to dial a devotion, but hard to buy a book. You can see from that just how she looks a pretty good eye at these at what goes on there. Yeah, it sounds like a really strong commentary mm -hmm. of, of what's happening in in the space she's living in for that specific time. And it's interesting that's essay format and yeah, and how that's structured. I wasn't expecting you to pick essays when we approached this um, planning this episode. I thought maybe that we just all kind of chunky books so this is a really interesting format and also the style of writing that you've picked for the first one 
Yes, and it's not a big, thick book. If, yeah. If you're dipping in and out, because I remember what teaching was like, uh, sometimes you don't have the time yeah. to and read. So this is a good one to start with, isn't it? It's for listeners who haven't got a lot of time, this would be a great one to pick up and to notice the, the, the formats, the style, and the commentary it's providing. Now, what have you picked as your second uh, piece of literature? My second piece of literature is entirely personal. It is the only book that I've ever read for pleasure where I've gone back immediately and read it again. And now I think I'm into four or five times of reading. And for this podcast, you put me back to it again. And so that, thank you for that. I mean, it's, it is wonderful. It is Fugitive Pieces by Anne Michaels. And this is the story of a boy who survives the Holocaust because he is just thin enough still to hide behind the wallpaper. I'm quoting him now. But it's also about memory. It's about personal history. It's about how we construct ourselves within the lives that we lead and what happens to us. It's not a book that one could say, um, oh, it's about this. It's almost like reading poetry. It is so beautiful. And Anne Michaels is a poet. So one does remember that. It's inevitable that you're going to. This book, you said you've read it several times. What have you taken away from each reading? Has it been something different? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Each reading, but enough, each reading has been just as exciting, if not more so than the one before. <laughs> and that, for me, has been very unusual because I've read, there are a number of books I've read lots of times because I've had to teach them. Mm -hmm. And actually, to find a book which is so exciting so readable which makes one stop and think so much that is really for me what makes this unique can i ask you you've just read it recently before we record um came here to record this podcast what did you take away this time from reading it recently the shades of remarks like there's a moment when love makes us believe in death for the first time you find Bits like, yes, jewels throughout. And sometimes you have it, those this other times you have. And this time reading it electronically and highlighting it, it's a totally different experience again. And so one is discovering again. Yes, it's like finding a new seam in a gold mine or something like that. I don't know how else to express it. It is just so wonderful. A truly special work. You shared a, a line from there, but I wondered if there are any other particular lines that have stood out this time you've read it, obviously there's lots that you'd like to share before we move on to the next book. I think very relevant is the past is never dead. It's never even past. That's really powerful. I can see what you mean about the poetry coming in mm. the future pieces and the author's experience uh, and skill as a poet. That's really beautiful and very powerful. It's a lovely way to express memory, which is, of course, the most fugitive of pieces that we have. But that's a wonderful piece uh, for us to talk about. I wonder how you're going to beat this. Like, what are we going to finish? Well, actually, I do know what you're going to close this with. Please introduce the, the third and final piece of literature. The third book is by Charles Dickens. It's Bleak House. Dickens, for me, is a master storyteller. And, you know, this is the master story that he wrote. And it's full of the most wonderful things. From his very opening, he is laying down what is going to be actually a crusade against the law in England at that time, which allowed lawyers to drain estates of money if there was an argument about who inherited. But he's also trying to show us how everybody is connected which for us now probably doesn't sound very odd. We know this because we're all connected on the internet. And, but then the interconnectedness of the upper class and the Roman sweeper, it wasn't recognized. It was almost as if they were living in totally different worlds and they were totally different animals almost. But this is a story which Dickens, in which Dickens will weave a wonderful wonderful tapestry 
and complete it so beautifully. And it's full of Dickensisms. Um, For those that have not read any Dickens, what would a, a typical feature of Dickens be? Aside from starting sentences with that. Typical feature of Dickens. Watch out for the names he gives to people. Mm. I mean, things like Inspector Bucket. I love that. Or Lady Deadlock. Mm. Um, And Celeste Deadlock. A wonderful man called Tricks, who for me dies the most fascinating death in literature. (laughs) And you have to read it to get the full flavour of the death. Um, <laughs> Esther Summerson, and I think you can tell from this, just the creation of the names, who are the heroes, heroines, who are the goodies, who are the baddies, if you want. It's a book to enjoy, because it's going to take you through love, crime, all sorts of things, but it is all going to be brought together in the end. And how did you encounter this book? Was this something that you studied in school as, as a student yourself? Because it is quite a hefty book. I wouldn't expect this to be on the curriculum, or was it? Yes, it was. Oh, gosh. (laughs) Um, Along with quite a number of those 19th century doorstops, (laughs) uh, as one of my colleagues used to say. Um, Yes, it was. And I didn't know what I was getting into when I got into it, but I've loved it ever since. And it is a book where, again, when you revisit it, you will find out more and more. Jules Verne was a great fan of Dickens. He said, I think he'd re- read Dickens, the whole of Dickens, 10 times. Gosh. And if you remember 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, there is a Captain Nemo, uh-huh. when there is a captain who's named Nemo in Bleak House. So there's the influence there. Yeah. You can see the whole arch. With such a vast book, how do you go about choosing a favorite line or quote? Do you want to have a go at sharing? Yeah, you have to be careful because if you go too far into it, you start doing prompt spoilers, which you've really got to avoid. The, pa- the second paragraph, which is where he starts to him about fog. Fog everywhere. Fog up the river where it flows among green heights and meadows. Fog down the river where it rolls, defiled among the tears of shipping. Fog on the Essex marshes, fog on the Kentish heights, fog creeping into the cabooses of collier bricks, fog lying out on the yards, fog drooping over the gunnels, fog in the eyes and throats of ancient Greenwich pensioners. And it's, it's wonderful because he is to use the fog as a symbol of far more than just a weather condition. It is what the course of chancery is doing and to society in England. It is the way that everybody experiences the fog and thus everybody is interconnected. A very relevant book for today's society, like you said, even though it was written so long ago, that interconnectivity will re- resonate more than ever for people that pick up this book. Yeah. I would say that my reason for reading is just a great story to us. And I love a story well told. There's nothing better. Chris, it's been lovely talking to you today. Thank you so much for sharing these three works of literature. It's been a tremendous pleasure. Oh, and read. Brilliant words to close this episode with. With all of those works, you can find those details in the show notes if you want to read along. And of course, we'd love to hear what your favourite works of literature are. You can share with us on the website or on social media or on Facebook, Instagram and LinkedIn. Finally, you can support the work we do at TESOL Pop by leaving a rating review wherever you listen to the podcast, by sharing today's episode with your teaching community, or by even buying us a coffee at ko forward slash TESOL Pop.